This meeting is being recorded. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on our NAVS channel. My name is Slavika Bogdanov. I created this uh, channel really to help uh, to inspire, to bring more awareness, more education, and hopefully save lives of narcissistic abused uh, victim and survivors. And the plan is to create a fund to not only help financially victims so that they can escape their condition, but also help educate and uh, bring more uh, counseling, more support, and more, of course, help needed uh, for the survivors uh, so that you can all thrive. Please um, subscribe to this channel and share uh, the video, of course, so that we can bring more education, more awareness. I started this because uh, when I started talking about my uh, past and, and my experience and hearing others share theirs, uh, it, it really made me feel better uh, about myself. And I had the feeling like I was healing somewhere uh, just from that, from the fact. So I'm hoping that you get that same sense of healing to know that you're not alone, you're not crazy, um, and also maybe educate you on some things that you never thought about before. So thank you for being here. And thank you, uh, Joyce, for joining us uh, today. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I will let you introduce yourself, say a little bit what you do, what you're about, so that we get to know you a little better. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity to be able to share a few things about myself. Uh, uh, for your listening audience, my name is Joyce Kyles. I am the CEO of Joyce Kyles Consulting. I am also an internationally credentialed speaker, uh, two-time Amazon best-selling author. I am a survivor of domestic abuse, and I also run a nonprofit called Walking Into a New Life, uh, where we focus on helping individuals to navigate a safe path towards independence. Um, as Joyce Kyle's Consulting, I do all things coaching, consulting, speaking, training, uh, with a big emphasis on personal and professional development, uh, specifically in those areas of domestic and sexual violence, of mental health, of health and wellness, and just life and thriving skills, Coach. Uh, my title has been a certified life and thriving skills, and people refer to me as a solution speaker. So that's what I try to bring in the spaces in which I work. Thank you so much. Well, I really, really appreciate you being here uh, today. So I'd like, if, you, if it's okay with you, to kind of understand your past, what you lived, um, and then, of course, how you came out of that, and then we'll move on to uh, the solutions that you bring or the advice that you can bring to our audience, if that's okay with you. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, very much uh, like what you described of yourself, you know, so many of us get into the work that we do a lot of times because of our lived experiences. And what we try to create is opportunities for individuals to know that they aren't alone, uh, but also to work in spaces where we see the gaps of, of help and support and services that may have been lacking when we were going through our own experiences. And so that's honestly how a lot of what I do was birthed. Um, one of the things that, I, that drew me to wanting to take part in this with you is because of my own experiences and recognizing that I've had two relationships that were abusive. And while the first one did primarily have a lot of physical elements to it. It was actually the second marriage uh, that was really what I feel like was, was my experience with domestic violence in a way that I didn't quite understand. Um, you know, in the first relationship, when we talk about abuse, we're all, we always think of the physical, you know, and so that is how I viewed abuse. Uh, and as I've learned, you know, domestic violence is about 80% of what you don't see in about 20% of what you do. So I was uh, always focused on what I saw. So when I got into this marriage for which I stayed in for many years, I did not recognize that I was being abused because we didn't fight. I knew something wasn't right. 
I knew that I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel good about the position that I was in, the position that I was putting my children in. I knew those things weren't right, but I didn't know what to call it because again, I wasn't being hit. Uh, so for years, I found myself going from a place of being uh, told that I was beautiful, that I was smart, that I was intelligent, that you know, I'm, I'm so lucky to have you, I'm blessed to have you. We're gonna do great things in our marriage to being told, you know, you're unattractive, you're too big, you're too small, you know, um, you're too dark, uh, you know, just all manner of, of things that started to really play on my ability to love myself and see my own self-worth. Um, went through definitely several periods of gaslighting, you know, and being made to feel that maybe what I'm thinking I'm going through is not what I'm actually going through. And so I didn't understand that abuse was so much deeper than physical. And, you know, and it started to spill over to my children as well. You know, so we are collectively in a house, not fully aware of what's happening, but at the same time, knowing that what's going on here is not healthy. You know, um, one time in particular that, that I can think of when we talk about this narcissistic behavior is that I started actually keeping a journal and I would have him to initial beside things that he would do or say that wow. made me uncomfortable, um, unhappy, um, caused you know financial issues for our homes, just things of that nature. Like I actually started when he would break promises about doing things and helping and supporting. And so he agreed to that initially because he wanted to see what I saw, at least so I thought. But the more he looked at it, I think he actually started to realize, okay, this is a, a behavior that I don't want to address. And so he decided to tell me that not only were these things not true, but that I was the one who was putting his initials beside the notes oh, in wow. the journal. <laughs> so, you know, you just, you, when you look back on it now, or when I look back on it now, I think, oh my God, I was truly being victimized in a way that I didn't understand. And it took me almost 10 years before I got the courage to say, you know what, I need to do something else. And I think the other important point in that is to, uh, for me to share in my own experience is that because I had gone through abuse before and I'd already expressed a lot of my concerns to my husband, um, a lot of that was used against me. And so, you know, I, I often quote this song of Teddy Pendergrass uh, for those who may be familiar, uh, but he's an RB singer. And he had a song that uh, talked about being a two-time loser, but he was talking about it being two-time loser in love. And I often thought about that and thought to myself, I don't want anybody to know that I am in yet again another failed relationship, oh, wow. that I did not want to admit to myself that I'd made a mistake in my judgment of having this person. And looking back, the signs were there. I just didn't know how to recognize them. And as a result, uh, I suffered a lot. My children suffer a lot. It took a long time for us to individually and collectively heal and rebuild. Uh, my first book is called Restoring the Hole in My Soul. And I purposely spell whole, W-H-O-L-E, because I wanted to really focus on the whole person. And honestly, um, it has become a lifesaver for me. It's actually been helpful to others who have read it. Um, I go back and reread it as I do this work. Um, but it is also a reminder of my own sense of resiliency. Uh, but it took me a long time. So for me, when I finally came, I was 37 years old, I think, when I finally just, I've had enough. What do you think um, attracted you? Or did you, what was your child? or your life before, uh, what do you think, do you know what was the root cause of you being attracted and going into these kinds of relationships? I think for me, um, it was about wanting to be loved and accepted. Um, so I can't necessarily blame it on any one specific thing or chain of events. Uh, my first relationship, you know, that I was 18. Uh, I was 16 when I met him, 18, you know, and so 
you know, that's a whole puppy love thing. And we just, we don't know what love is and we don't know what love looks like um, at that point. And so you're still learning a lot about yourself. So by the time I got into um, the second relationship of real substance and, and meaningfulness in that marriage, um, I still had an understanding about some things that I didn't want, but I wasn't really clear and sure about what I did want. And I didn't spend enough time getting to know myself. So I just feel like it made me more vulnerable, if you will, to uh, being open to a relationship that turned out to not be healthy at all. Because the way I see it is if we, you know, we, we go quickly into these kind of relationships often because we lack self-esteem and we want to be loved at any cost. Um, is that, you think, one of the reasons that create these kinds of unbalanced relationship or that oh. we get in without looking at the red flags that may have alerted us that something was going to go wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Self-esteem or lack thereof. Um, not having supports, you know, family supports. One of the things that I uh, dealt with in that, that marriage was by the time I was fully rooted into that marriage, um, my dad and my grandmother who raised us, they were both deceased. And I'm living in another city away from really all of my family. You know, so I had a lot of things that I was trying to contend with. I'm the oldest of my siblings. So I didn't want them to know that, you know, big sister is dealing with the issues that she's dealing with, you know, at home. And they're in other cities too, you know, and they have their own families and their own lives. So absolutely when your esteem has been compromised, if you don't have those supports, uh, if you don't see positive examples around you, uh, and if you are finding yourself becoming isolated from friends and family, that gives that that perpetrator, that abuser, the opportunity to really weigh in on your vulnerabilities and, and exploit them. Um, when I met, you know, this the husband that I'm speaking of, when I met him, I was actually in a good place. Uh, I'd gotten back into college. I entered a beauty contest. Uh, and one at the college campus, I was the oldest person to ever participate. And I'm, you know, married, all this kind of stuff, you know, so it's like, for me, that was a big deal. So I was really in a, in a good space. When I met him, my esteem was high, I was exercising, I felt good about myself, the direction that I was in. So that wasn't my situation at that time. But definitely, I wanted to be loved. And I thought this was an, a, a man and an opportunity that we could go and grow together and and it wasn't and what made you how did you leave or what was the trigger that you said okay now enough is enough i have to go the day that i realized that i was going to lose my home and wow. um he had come in from work and he worked very sporadically he knew that we were getting ready to go into uh, foreclosure and that we had to have X number of dollars in by a certain date. Um, he came in and basically got on the couch. He didn't provide me any uh, financial support to help with it and knew that the days were coming to a close and told me he had the money. He just wasn't going to do it. Um, oh, at wow. least he had some, you know, so I don't, I don't think that he had the entire amount, but he did have some. Um, and I was aware of that. And I thought to myself, this is, this is it. Um, I'm going to lose my home. And if I'm going to lose my home, I'm going to lose it with me and my children in it. And he was not going to be a part of that. And we literally took his things and set them outside on the porch. Um, and I told him at that point, he could leave by choice or by force, but I was gonna call the police and have him removed. Um, and that is really, that was the day that I, I think at that point, everything started to crash around me. And I started realizing that we're gonna be in a position where we don't have a place to stay. I've got to think about where my children and I are going to be. This person is not helpful in my transition um, and he's not been helpful influence for me or them. Um, so that was literally the day. Uh, and so for two weeks following, we were working on 
where we were going to live in that time frame, uh, but he wasn't there. So that was that was the day of triggering for me. Totally understand that. And um, so how long ago was that? 2008, June 2008. And how did you, um, what was your journey to healing? What was the different steps you took that you might want to share so that it might help others? And, you know, I encourage people to buy your book and read, but just in the meantime, what would be the, uh, the, the, different steps you think oh sure absolutely um the book and and what i'm about to share now uh there are some of these things that are written in the book because that was part of my healing journey so my my answer is kind of simultaneous Uh, so of course i want people to buy the book but at the same time uh writing was healing for me i had been encouraged to write since third grade So for me, my hopes, my dreams, my fears, my frustrations, my trials, my triumphs, writing has always been a part of me. I found that to be a saving grace for me. Um, And it was actually my my current husband that encouraged me to write the book in the first place. So that's a whole story in itself. Um, But also just daily affirmations. And I think sometimes we think of affirmations in these big grandural type of things. When you are going through the beginning stages of healing, you don't see yourself necessarily as beautiful or attractive or smart or intelligent. Um, We tend to not give ourselves any grace. You know, we blame ourselves for being in this position instead of putting the blame where it belongs, which is on the abuser in the first place. They took advantage of our trust. They took advantage of our vulnerabilities. They took advantage of our love and our caring spirits and, and natures. And we have to get to a place where, and that's that's what I came to, of walking the path of getting back to self. What things did I like about myself? There was something about that abuser that was attractive to him because otherwise we wouldn't have had a conversation. But in my doing that and getting counseling and support groups and that I think those are key. Those are so key. Um, people have told me that you're crazy if you go to counseling and I tell folks you're crazy if you don't go um, because whatever is ingested in you has to come out. And sometimes it will show up in a way that is uncomfortable and embarrassing and hurtful and harmful. So I encourage people to write. I encourage people to seek counseling. I encourage people to go into group sessions uh, or one-on-ones if you're not comfortable in a group session. I encourage um, uh, arts, performing arts. So if you like to skate or bowl or write or uh, act, uh, pick up those hobbies, you know, and develop. They don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the best actor or the best actress. Just get it out, you know, write, write poetry, whatever works for you. Um, but honestly, to just take this day by day and to give yourself that sense of grace and, and be proud of yourself and celebrate your wins. You know, um, I have shared before that sometimes the biggest and most successful day I had was the first day that I went through the entire day without crying. Mm, The first day that I got out of the bed and felt good about me, and that's a process. Um, It takes time. So I would say, give yourself grace, reach out to someone and talk to someone and not necessarily a family member or, or a friend who may know what you've gone through because sometimes those individuals tend to be a bit biased. And if they aren't uh, clinicians, sometimes they don't know the right things to say, even if they're well-meaning. And then some honestly are looking forward to being able to tell you, I told you so. Yeah. And, you know, and I've experienced that. So that's why no one knew certain things. That's probably the last thing you want to hear. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to be told that we're, that we've been victimized. We already know that. What we do need to be told is and and directed and guided into how we can heal, how we can make our lives better, what tools and resources are available to me. And if you don't have them, and in my case, there were certain parts of my life and things that I needed that I didn't see in my community, so I created them. And that's how Walking Into a New Life started. That's how Joyce Kyle's Consulting started, because it gave me an opportunity to give people who had gone through abuse and trauma 
an outlet to receive tangible resources that people don't always think about that we actually need to heal. Thank you for that. Um, I, I just had a call with someone else and we kind of debated and, and we were stuck. So maybe, maybe you can provide enlightenment or an advice. So both of us uh, lived through uh, narcissistic abuse with our parents and then relationships one after the other. And so we, uh, the question was, where do you start to rebuild the way a normal, normal relationship or what it, sh it should look like when you don't have any examples or you know, when, when you're kind of lost and you don't, you never live that in your life, where do you start to build to know this is, this seems like that's the way it's supposed to be, to be healthy. And this is, on. so where do you start to build that knowledge? Um, for one, a couple of things, I think. One is to be honest and, and realistic and knowing that even the best of relationships or best of perceived relationships still have flaws and they still they still may have traumas and things that have gone on that are not discussed um and i think i looked at one relationship thought oh yeah this is the way i want things to be without really taking into account what it took for them to get to that point so mm -hmm. i would say to Find those relationships outside of the, the, the parameters of what you are normally accustomed to looking for them in. Uh, a lot of times we do look within families or friends. I say venture out even further than that to see what relationships look normal and healthy and solid um, and not necessarily the relationship type, the, the celebrity relationships because uh, those have all, they, they have stuff all over the place. But I've found that even like just going on Instagram and watching some of the, the reels that have been created and pages that have been created with real people sharing real experiences, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, some of them are black, some of them are white, some are Asian. Um, I think that we have to have an open mind about what relationships look like and, and culturally speaking, you know, because I think that's a part of it too. What is your culture? What does, what does culturally, what does a healthy relationship look like? And if you've not ever experienced it, you don't really know what that is. So one of the things I encourage in, in the book is to write out a list of all the things that you want, all the things that you want. I don't care how big or how small they are, because that is going to be the definition of what is a healthy relationship for you because what you desire to have and I said something as simple as smoking smoking may be unhealthy to someone whereas smoking cigars is an awesome cool thing to do but if I have asthma I can't be in a relationship with someone who smokes that is unhealthy for me to accept someone in my life that smokes knowing that it's going to make me sick um, there's a sense of compromise to, to your question that I think that we also have to consider. Um, and that is that we don't compromise certain things that will inflict our health. Um, and I think sometimes we, we will do that for the sake of saving the relationship that didn't need to be saved. So uh, knowing this our is, boundaries. Yeah, yes, knowing absolutely. Our so I think in the short answer, um, looking at other ways and in, in, in that people operate and move in their relationships but starting within and having the mindset within of these are the things that I want. This is what healthy means for me. And then build from that and look for opportunities and places and spaces where you at least recognize there's a sense of synergy with those same type of like-minded individuals. But also keep your tentacles up, as I say, if you start to see that this is wavering a little bit from what makes me comfortable, trust your gut. The red flag is a red flag. Don't try to make it green. It's red and you move on and make peace with it. And I think that's the last thing I'll say on that too, is making peace with our pasts. Um, 
I've not always had the healthiest relationships with different, you know, people in my past, either whether it be friend or family. Um, but I think we have to come to a point of making peace with that and being okay with that and setting those boundaries for ourselves that says, this is my definition of healthy and I will not do anything that will compromise what healthy is for me. Thank you for saying that. Um, I'm curious to know, now that years has, have passed, um, how is the relationship with your children and their father? Um, relationship is wonderful with us. Um, actually, my first uh, experience with abuse is actually my children's father. So, no, but that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, how is the with, relationship? Yeah, with with, with them, the that, children's father. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, the abuser, that, basically. Yes. So the the one that I have spoken about all this time in terms of being married to, that is that was their stepdad. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Yes, that was their stepdad. Um, and so that relationship is not. Um, of course. We have all cut ties with him. That was the healthiest and best thing that we could all do. Of course. Yes. Yes. So um, no, there is no relationship there. Um, but we as we a have family. No, uh, healthy we relationship with the, the step, the current stepdad, correct? Wonderful. Wonderful. They call him Pops. <laughs> um, he has been an example of what healthy looks like. And that is actually, it's, it's interesting that you even mentioned that and, and brought him mm. into the picture that way, because that, that's a very good point to what you asked about with what healthy looks like. My children are finally being able to see what healthy looks like. And they've been able to see it consistently for the past 10, 11 years. We've been married almost eight years. And he was my friend we became friends prior to that, maybe two to three years prior. So they've always known him as a gentleman. They've always seen him being nice to me in friendship and in building business. He's the one who helped me to create the business. He's the one who created the nonprofit. Um, he's the one who helped to give it its name. And so they got to see that from its beginning stages and it formulate into something beautiful. And now we have grandchildren, you know, we've got children. Oh, congratulations. And yes, thank you. So, you know, it's been a really good experience. They've been able to see firsthand up close and personal the difference between their mom being called out of their out of her name, um, being belittled and betrayed, um, to being able to not worry about me. The the one of the best things that my son ever told me was that, you know, mom, it's like. I don't think about it anymore. Like, I don't worry about you. And I appreciate that. My, my girls, like I said, he's pops to them and they seek advice from him and relationship advice or business advice or school advice. It's a real normal family. But in all honesty, it took me a couple of years, even after we got married, to really fully embrace it, not because of anything that he had done, but because it wasn't normal for me. And I, I remember going into counseling and talking to my, my counselor about it. It's like, well, is anything happens? Like, no, that's the problem. It's like, I'm <laughs> waiting for the other shoe to drop and it hasn't. Um, and I'm still, August 1st will be eight years for us married. And it's been beautiful. It's been absolutely- I love it because it really gives inspiration and hope to whomever might be watching that there is an after there yes. is a rainbow there is something after there is an afterlife there yes. is a light at the end yes. of the tunnel so yes. that is uh, that is very um very nice i i want to ask you where can people find you if they want to reach out if they need counseling if they want to find Ooh. you how what is the best way to find you the best way to find me is JoyceKyles.com, uh, my name.com. <laughs> so there is information about me, what I do, how to connect with me on social media. I'm across all social platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, but everything is Joyce Kyles. So it's JoyceKyles.com. Um, and I actually- And I'll put it also in the, thank in the you. description so okay. people can just click and thank find you, you so there. so much. Afterwards. I wanted to say that the FBI, I spoke for them a couple of months ago, 
And that was one of the reasons that they did reach out to me is because I, they said that they could get people to come and speak about their experiences. But what they liked is that they were consistently able to find that I speak about the aftermath, that I talk and share that there is hope, there is life, there is love, there is happiness, um, personally and professionally. There's a, a chapter dedicated to my children in our happiness journey. There's a chapter that's dedicated to my now husband in that book, because I really wanted people to see, and if your audience takes nothing else away from what I've said, that there is happiness, there is life after, there is hope, there is help, there is healing. You are not alone. And once you take that first step to healing, the world is, is endless with opportunities such as yours and what you're doing. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to just share a little bit about my journey uh, and that it's, it's good, it's, it's a good journey. I really appreciate it so much. Uh, I appreciate for your advice. I appreciate for the experience and of course for for that kind of hope and and inspiration that it gives everyone. So thank you so much. I will put the link to your uh, to your website in the description so that people can find you easily. And I will thank you all for uh, coming to this channel. Please subscribe to be able to see more of these interviews. Uh, I plan to have a bunch more. Uh, you can go to NarcissisticVictimsAbuseVictims.com. Uh, the link will also be below so that you can find out a little more about what I plan to do. I have a few different dreams that I'm, I'm hoping to uh, fulfill, one of which will be to have a fund to actually help financially uh, victims to get counseling, to get education, to have also courses so that you can reinsert the marketplace and uh, and have more support. I think first the financial support I think is very necessary because a lot of victims cannot escape because of the finances and then reinsertion into the market, uh, the workplace uh, with classes and uh, and hopefully do some documentaries and do some films to bring more awareness, I think a lot of people need to know, like, you know, like you said, and it's funny you said that because I, I just posted a post on LinkedIn. I had a conversation with a man and I told him that I was a victim of abuse, of narcissistic abuse. And the first thing he said is, yeah, my dad was violent. And when I reached 15, uh, I could hit him back. So he stopped being violent. So he immediately associated uh, the abuse with violence, where my abuse was much worse because it didn't leave any physical mark, but it went, it dig deep into my soul and attack the root of me. Uh, and the scars are much deeper and invisible to the, to the, to the eye. And so, um, and so I love that you explored that the two different relationship where now you knew what violence was, but you never expected the other form of uh, mental abuse, uh, which is, which causes really deep trauma into uh, our self esteem into our, who we believe we are as human beings. So I totally you know, uh, I totally applaud you for sharing that and uh, and thank you. And I hope we, we have another call in the future, talk again, uh, have another one of these chats. Um, and thank you so much, Joy, uh, Joyce. I really, really appreciate it. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.